Good morning, everybody. Welcome back. I'm so happy to meet you again in this new project. Important lessons in management of acute respiratory failure by critical care ultrasound. Really, in this case scenario, we will uh, discuss together in logic way and will ask ourselves very important questions during management of critical ill patient by critical care ultrasound. And the answer of these important questions will be very important lessons in management. I hope you will get my point in this case. Uh, this is a 60-year-old female patient, no case of diabetes, bleeds, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, three vessel disease, waiting for cabbage. She was admitted to our ICU with severe respiratory stress, shortly arrested for 15 minutes, recovered and connected to mechanical ventilator, heart rate 60 per minute, blood pressure 65 over 45. The absolute diagnosis was acute cardiac pulmonary edema, and this is very logic. Uh, because this patient also give a history of uh, acute cardiac pulmonary edema during cardiac catheterization. ECG, left bundle branch block, chemistry, creatinine start to increase 1.6 milligram per deciliter, ABG, mixed metabolic and respiratory acidosis, BH 7.19, lactate is sky high, and auto saturation 95 on 100% oxygen. Severe hypoxia and shock severe hypoxia and shock and arrest. There is very uh, grave pictures and very uh, bad uh, state. Patient was anuric and cardiac enzyme rising. Problem list at the moment, very bad list. Shock, respiratory failure, renal failure. Differential diagnosis, acute cardiac pulmonary edema with cardiogenic shock, Acute non cardiogenic pulmonary edema with non cardiogenic shock, both. We started critical care ultrasound. As you all of you know now, we start with IBC. I will keep the date and the timing to get the feeling of the importance of critical care ultrasound as regards time factor in this patient. The maximum diameter of inferior vena cava is 1.36. It's not too much dilated, and at the same time, collapsibility for my vision here, it is more than 50% collapsing. So this patient, despite very, uh, he is, as you see, uh, there is the signs of respiratory stress by contracting the abdominal muscles. Patient is in severe stress, but 1.36 and more than 50% collapsing is not going with severe shock of cardiogenic origin, because I will expect in this state that inferior vena cava will be more dilated. Heart, first the uh, forward chamber view, as you see from the visual assessment, it's not too bad. This heart is not too bad to cause severe shock and severe. It's really not too bad. This is a four chamber view. As you see, the left ventricle lateral wall is contracting properly, is contracting properly, but definitely the apex and the septum, inferior septum, is not contracting well. It is almost akinetic, but at least the lateral wall is doing a very good job. Short axis view also, the inferior wall is sticking and contracting and the lateral wall is doing well, but the septum is a problem. And two chamber view, the inferior wall is sticking probably, probably and contracting. And ejection fraction by visual assessment is going with 45, 50% and also by MMO mode it is 40, 60% as you see there is a uh, sickening even for the septum, mild sickening, and ejection fraction is 46%. So, this contraction is not too bad to cause this situation. And the end of the third diameter is 3.7, it's normal. The heart is not dilated. That means uh, it is acute process, it's not chronic process with the remodeling. 
And if you see acute process and ejection fraction is not too bad, and the state is very bad as regards shock and, and pulmonary edema and hypoxia, you should think about the other important factor causing this, which is the valve, aortic and mitral valve. And you should search for acute valve deletion. As we mentioned in the previous uh, cases, and you see here, no regurge in the aorta and no regurge in the mitral. So no significant regurge lesion and no bad ejection fraction. Okay, first lesson. You have now, by critical care ultrasound, mild decrease in left ventricular ejection fraction, wall motion abnormality, apical and septal, hypo severe hypokinesia, no significant mitra and aortic valve lesion. First lesson, please ask yourself, does it cause severe shock and severe acute respiratory failure? My opinion is not. So, what are really the ICU concerns? What are really concerned us in the ICU is the stroke volume and lift atrial pressure. It's not the ejection fraction only. First, stroke volume. Thanks to critical care ultrasound, we can measure the stroke volume very simply and accurately by measuring the lift ventricular outflow tract diameter and putting the pulsed wave doubler at the uh, half centimeter above the aortic valve to trace the LVOT VTI, which is the distance of the blood in the aortic outflow tract. And if you convert this diameter to area by multiplying by squares of the diameter, 1.7 multiplied by 1.7 squares the diameter, and multiply by 0.785, you will get the area. And if you multiply the area by the distance of the blood, which is the VTI, you will get the volume, which is the stroke volume. In our patient, stroke volume is 20 milli, which is very low, and which explain the state of the patient, the shock state of the patient. Second lesson, stroke volume is determined by ejection fraction, contractility, and the preload and afterload. In our patient, ejection fraction has an element, but it's not too much impact. So you should search for preload and afterload. And as we mentioned, in fear of vena cava, it's narrow for a heart failure, for a cardiac patient. So you should consider preload and fluid status in this situation. And afterload, severe vasoconstriction. Okay, second, left atrial pressure. Because I have a patient with severe hypoxia, cardiac patient, ischemic heart disease patient with severe hypoxia. So in this situation, I should know what about left atrial pressure. Thanks to American Society of Echocardiography with a European Association of Cardiovascular Imaging of new guidelines for pathological dysfunction <clears throat> to diagnose left atrial pressure increase or normal, you will put the pulsed wave doubler at the tip of mitral valve. Uh, you have three choice, three, three uh, possibilities. If the E over A, basal feeling of the left atrial, uh, of the left ventricle uh, from the left atrial at early diastole, over the A, which is atrial, it is more than or equal to, it is straight away increased left atrial pressure with grade three diastole dysfunction. If the E over A ratio is less than or equal to 0.8, and there is a small E wave less than 50 centimeters per second. So straight away, you have normal lift atrial pressure grid one that's with function. If in between both E over A ratio more than 0.8 and less than two, you should do three parameter here. You should measure three parameter to uh, accurately diagnose that sort of function and lift atrial pressure. You will do what's called E over E prime. E is the passive feeling of the lift ventricle or lift atrium. And E, which is the degree of the same of the mitral valve annulus uh, during the history, and you can get it very easy by tissue doppler. The average uh, uh, E uh, prime, which is the septal and lateral E prime, uh, if put the average, the ratio will be 14. If you take only the septal uh, E prime, will be uh, more than 15. If you take the lateral E prime, the ratio should be uh, less than 13.
Second, you will measure tricuspid gauge velocity if more than 2.8 meter per second, it will be another point, and you will measure lift interval volume index if more than 34 milli per meter square, it will be another point. If two point or three positive, you will go in this direction and this lift interval pressure grade to the source function. If two or more negative, you will go in this direction. Uh, back to our patient, this is how to measure the septal E prime, which is the uh, diastolic descent of the mitral valve annulus during uh, diastole from the septal mitral, annul uh, mitral valve annulus. It, here is the E prime. It is really small, 3.6 centimeter per second, and normal uh, more than seven. And this is the E, which is a passive feeling of the left ventricle from left atria during early diastole. This is the E, which is 97. If you put the E over E septal E prime, it is high. One point, the score one point towards increasing. So, so we have one point positive. Uh, let us go to the second point. Second point is the tricuspid valve uh, regurg velocity. If more than 2.8 meter uh, per second, that means another uh, positive point. But here it is less than two, so negative point. And the third point is the lift atrial volume index. If more than 34 milli per meter square will be another possible point, but here is 42. It is 42 uh, total. Yeah, and the patient uh, blood surface area is two. That means it's 21 uh, uh, milli per meter square uh, lift atrial volume index. So it's another negative point. So our patient, according to American site of echocardiography, has grade one the source function with normal lift atrial pressure. So. Does it explain the severe hypoxia due to acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema? Yani imagine patient, you diagnose, presum your presumed, presumed diagnosis is acute cardiogenic pulmonary edema. And O2 saturation is 95 or 100% if I do. So, could this lift, small lift atrial, small lift atrial, with normal pressure in the left atria, could this lead to back pressure in the pulmonary uh, arteries and to cause florid pulmonary edema with this low pressure and low size and low, and low uh, at grade one diastolic function? My opinion, no. And the TAPSI is slightly decreased. So, third lesson, if you are not convinced that left atrial pressure is high and there is a restrictive pattern to cause increased left atrial pressure and the back pressure and congestion. So ask, please ask yourself, does left atrial pressure explain the severe hypoxia? Third important questions and the lessons, please ask yourself, does left atrial pressure in this patient explain this severe hypoxia? Please go to the lab. If you are not convinced that the left atrial pressure can cause this severe acute cardiopulmonary edema, please go to the lung. When we go to the lung, went to the lung in our patient, massive right side pleural effusion, and complete lower loop, left lower loop consolidation with air from the crown. So I have two major loops are lost in this patient, one by consolidation and one by pleural effusion. So now I get my point. I get now there is something else, there is something else causing the patient suffering besides the heart, but there is something else. I reach to this conclusion very logically and by asking myself questions and at each stage of assessment, to reach to hard fact at the end and the proper diagnosis. You see, there is blood flowing in the consolidation. There is too much consolidation. I keep the date and time in all slides to get the feeling of importance of critical care ultrasound as regards time factor, mild left ventricular dysfunction, grade one that's all dysfunction, right massive pleural effusion, left lower loop consolidation in a couple of minutes. How can you treat? Okay, 
We reach to the proper diagnosis in logic way by asking important questions. So once you get the full proper diagnosis, it would be very easy to manage the patient. We give IV fluid guided by LVOT VTI. Patient was given normal sign and so to by car. Really, the patient was bradycardic despite severe shock. So we, uh, because he has been on beta blockers, adrenaline IV infusion was started, to guard against medication to bradycardia and to worsen shock states. And after giving the adrenaline infusion and the fluids, LVOT jumped from 9.71 to 17. Very good achievement in very short time because you are targeting the most important pathology you diagnose very clearly by critical ultrasound. Despite giving the fluids, still no restricted pattern, still E more than A. That means you are not going in left atrial pressure increase. And we aspirate right blood infusion under ultrasound diet at the same time. We give proper antibiotic coverage because the patient has pneumonia. And this is a repeated CT couple of days after, blood infusion is decreased a lot after aspiration. We give dual antiplatelet and atherometric anticoagulant because of prominent wall motion abnormality we see by in uh, ECHO and the cardiology uh, team uh, agree about that and they are not proceeding any uh, intervention at the moment. After a few days and after correction of acute precipitating factor, patient was extubated and connected to non-invasive infiltrator. Really, very quickly after correcting the precipitating factor, we remove the patient and connect to a non-invasive ventilator. Because the patient has restricted on non-invasive ventilator, this is the E over A ratio. This is the diastolic function assessment at the beginning. Here, the patient was gasping on invasive mechanical ventilation in these pictures. But, but here on non-invasive ventilation, the patient was really calm on non-invasive ventilation, very calm, but has high left atrial pressure and restricted pattern. E over E ratio is more than two. That means despite being uh, in congested site in this state, uh, he was calm because uh, the pneumonia and the pleural diffusion was done. But here, despite low lip atrial pressure, he was gasping because there was an, a, a lung element that is in the chest problem here, which is a consolidation and the pleural diffusion. So uh, here, and this confirmed our uh, diagnosis that the problem not only is a cardiac, but also it is consolidation and the pleural diffusion. And because of this restricted pattern, and this is a value of follow-up critical care ultrasound, we are keep giving the uh, prosomide and deloading our patient because we know we cannot remove non-invasive ventilation by this restricted pattern because non-invasive ventilation guard against the congestion and really this patient is charge alive from ICU. Thanks, God. Uh, take home message. In ICU, we are concerned by left atrial pressure and stroke volume. Look for ejection fraction, assess the ejection fraction, but if the ejection fraction is not explaining the shock, the cardiac shock, uh, and the patient has acute heart failure with normal in the diastolic diameter, check valve. If the valve is okay, please, you should check stroke volume and left atrial pressure. So this will explain. If the stroke volume is low, go to the second step, assess the preload and afterload. Left atrial pressure, if you assess left atrial pressure and it's low, uh, despite the severe hypoxia, go to the lung. You will get the answer. A stroke volume is not only ejection fraction. A stroke volume is ejection fraction, preload and afterload. Cardiac output is not. Cardiac output is stroke volume, multilateral heart rate. So, please correct relative bradycardia in a shocked patient. A struggle to know the precipitating factor in your shocked and the hypoxic patient for proper access to the lung. Use critical ultrasound in all hypoxic shock patients. Thank you a lot for your appreciated listening. See you in another project by month.